The sky over Loch Lagan was full of low-hanging clouds, pearl gray, mirrored in the black water of the lake. Spring had not yet arrived. A crest of ice and snow lay over the shore. Ripples of yellow sand from an autumn tide still are preserved beneath. The crisp, cold smell of pine and fresh-cut wood rose from the forest. A gravel road wound up from the northern shores of the lake to the complex of the covert, and Temeraire turned to follow up to follow it up the low mountain. A quadrangle of several large wooden sheds stood together on a level clearing near the top, open in the front and rather like half a stable in appearance. Men were working outside on metal and leather. Obviously, the ground crew is responsible for the maintenance of the aviator's equipment. None of them so much as glanced up at the dragon's shadow crossing over their workplace as Temeraire flew on to the headquarters. The main building was a very medieval sort of fortification. Four bare towers joined by thick stone walls framing an enormous courtyard in the front and a squat, imposing hall that sank directly into the mountaintop and seemed to have grown out of it. The courtyard was almost entirely overrun. A young regal cooper, twice Temeraire's size, sprawled drowsing over the flagstones with a pair of brown and purple Winchesters, even smaller than Bladius, sleeping right on his back. Three mid-sized yellow reapers were in a mingled heap on the opposite side of the courtyard, their white striped sides rising and falling in rhythm. As Lawrence climbed down, he discovered the reason for the dragon's choice of resting place. The flagstones were warm, as if heated from below, and Temeraire murmured happily and stretched himself on the stones beside the yellow reapers as soon as Lawrence had unloaded them, him. A couple of servants had come out to meet him, and they took the baggage off his hands. He was directed to the back of the building, through narrow dark corridors, musty smelling, until he came out into another open courtyard that emerged from the mountainside and ended with no railing. Dropping off sheer into another sh ice-strewn valley, five dragons were in the air, wheeling in graceful formation like a flock of birds. The point leader was a long wind, instantly recognizable by the black and white ripples bordering its orange-tipped wings, which faded to a dusty blue along their extraordinary length. A couple of yellow reapers held the flanking positions, and the ends were anchored by a pale greenish-gray cooper to the left, and a silver-gray dragon spotted with blue and black patches to the right. Lawrence could not immediately identify its breed. <clears throat> Though their wings beat in wholly different time, their relative positions hardly changed, until the long one signal mid-wingman waved a flag. Then he switched off smoothly as dancers, reversing so the long one was flying last. At some other signal, Lawrence did not see. They all backwind at once, performing a perfect loop and coming back into the original formation. He saw at once that the maneuver gave the long one the greatest sweep over the ground during the pass while retrieving the protection of the rest of the wing around it. Naturally, it was the greatest offensive threat among the group. The Titus, you are still dropping low in the pass. Try changing to a six-beat pattern in the loop. It was the deep-resounding voice of the dragon coming from above. Lawrence turned and saw a golden-hued dragon with the reaper markings in pale green and the edges of his wings deep orange, perched on an outcropping to the right of the courtyard. He bore no rider and no harness, save if it could be so could be called so, a broad golden neck ring stubbed with rounds of pale green jade stone. Lawrence stared. Out in the valley, the wing repeated its looping pass. Better, the dragon called approvingly. Then he turned his head and looked down. Captain Lawrence, he said. Admiral Powley said you would be arriving. You came in good time. I'm the let Solaritus? Solaritus, training master here. He spread his wings for lift and leapt easily down into the courtyard. Lawrence bowed mechanically. Celetris, Celeria, Celeria, Celetri, Celerita, 
Salaritas, was a mid-white-weight dragon, perhaps a quarter of the size of a regal cooper, smaller even than Temeraire's present juvenile, present juvenile size. Hmm, he said, lowering his head to inspect Lawrence closely. The deep green irises of his eyes seemed to turn and contract around the narrowed pupil. Hmm, well, you are a good deal older than most healers, but that is often all to the good when we must hurry along the young dragon. As in Timur's case, I think we must. He lifted his head and called out into the valley again. Lily, remember to keep your neck straight on the loop. He turned back to Lawrence. Now then, he has no special offensive capabilities showing, as I understand it. No, sir. The answer and the address were automatic. Tone and attitude alike both declared the dragon's rank, and habit carried Lawrence along through his surprise. And Sir Edward Howe, who identified his species, was one was of the opinion that it was unlikely he should develop such, though not out of the question. Yes, yes, Celeritas. Celeritas interrupted. I have read Sir Edward's work. He is an expert on the Oriental breeds, and I would trust his judgment in the matter over mine own. It is a pity, for we could w well do with one of those Japanese poison spitters or water spout makers. Now that would be useful against a French flamme de Gore, but heavy combat weight, I understand. He is at present time nine tons in weight, and it is nearly six weeks since he was hatched, Lawrence said. Good, that is very good. He ought to double that. Florida said, and he rubbed the side of his a claw over his forehead thoughtfully. So, all is as I had heard. Good. We will be pairing Temeraire with Maximus, the regal cooper currently here in training. The two of them together will serve as loose backing arc for Lily's formation. That is the long one there. He gestured with his hand out at the formation willing in the valley, and Lawrence, still bewildered, turned to watch it for a moment. The dragon continued. Of course, I must see Temeraire fly before I can determine the specific course of your training, but I need to finish this session, and after a long journey, he will not show to any adva to advantage in any case. Ask Lieutenant Granby to show you about and tell you where to find the feeding, the feeding grounds. You will find him in the officer's club. Come back with Temeraire tomorrow, an hour past first last. First light. This was a command. An acknowledgment was required. Very good, sir, Lawrence said, concealing his stiffness and formality. Fortunately, Celeritas did not seem to notice. He was already leaping back up to his higher vantage point. Lawrence was very glad that he did not know where the officer's club was. He felt he could have used a quiet week to adjust his thinking, rather than the 15 minutes it took him to find a servant who could point him in the right direction. Everything which he had ever heard about dragons was turned upon its head. The dra that dragons were useless without their handlers, that unharnessed dragons were only good for breeding. He, lo he no longer wondered at all the anxiety on the part of the aviators. What would the world think to know they were trained, given orders by one of the best beasts they supposedly controlled? Of course, considered rationally, he had long possessed proofs of dragon intelligence and independence, and Temer's pers person, but these had developed gradually over time, and he unconsciously came to think of Temeraire as a fully realized individual without extending the implication of the rest of dragon kind. The first surprise passed. He could, without too much difficulty, accept the idea of a dragon as instructor, but it would certainly create a scandal of extraordinary proportions among those who had no similar personal experience. It had not been so long, only shortly before the revolution in France had cast Europe into war again, since the proposal had been made by government that unharnessed dragons ought to be killed, rather than supported at the public expense and kept for breeding. The rationale offered had been a lack of need at that present time, and that their recalcitrance likely only hurt the fighting bloodlines. Parliament had calculated a savings of more than £10 million per annum. The idea had been previously considered, then dropped abruptly without public explanation. It was whispered, however, that every cap admiral of the corps stationed in range of London had jointly descended upon the Prime Minister and informed him that if the law were, pa were passed, the entire corps would mutiny. 
He had previously heard the story with disbelief, disbelief, not for the proposal, but for the idea that senior officers, any officers, would behave in such a way. The proposal had always seemed to him wrong-minded, but only as a sort of foolish short-sightedness so common among bureaucrats, who thought it better to save ten shillings on sailcloth and risk an entire ship for six thousand pounds. Now he considered his own indifference with a sense of mortification. Of course they would have mutinied. Still preoccupied with his thoughts, he walked through the archway to the officers' club without attention and only caught the ball that hurtled at his head by reflex. A mingled cheer and cry of protest both went up at once. That was a clear goal. He's not on your team, a young man, bravely out of boyhood with bright yellow hair, was complaining. Nonsense, Martin. Certainly he is, aren't you? Another of the participants, grinning broadly, came up to Lawrence to take the ball. He was a tall, lanky fellow with dark hair and sunburnt cheekbones. Apparently so, Lawrence said, amused, handing over the ball. He was a little astonished to find a collection of officers playing children's games indoors and in such disarray. In his possession of coat and neckcloth, he was more formally dressed than all of them. A couple had even taken off their shirts entirely. The furniture had been pushed pell-mell into the edges of the room, and the carpet rolled up and thrust into a corner. Lieutenant John Granby and assigned, the dark-haired man said. Have you just arrived? Yes, Captain Will Lawrence on Demerere, Lawrence said, and he was startled and not a little dismayed to see the small, the smile fall off Granby's face, the open friendliness vanishing at once. The Imperial! The cry was almost general, and half the boys and men in the room disappeared past them, pelting towards the courtyard. Lawrence, taken aback, blinked after them. Don't worry, the yellow-haired young man coming up to introduce himself answered his look of alarm. We all know better than to pester a dragon. They're only going to get have a look. Though you might have some trouble with the cadets. We have around two dozen of them here, and they make it their mission to plague the life out of everyone. Midwingman Ezekiel, Ezekiel Martin, and you can forget my first name now that you have it, if you please. Informality was so obviously the usual mode among them that Lawrence could hardly take offense though it was not in the least what he was used to. Thank you for the warning. I will see Timur does not let them bother him, he said. He is relieved to see no sign of Granby's attitude of dislike in Martin's greeting and wished he might ask the friendlier of the two for guidance. However, he did not mean to disobey orders, even if given by a dragon, so he turned to Granby and said formally, Celeritas tells me to ask you to show me about. Will you be so good? Certainly, Granby said, trying for equal formality. But it sat less naturally on him, and he sounded artificial and wooden. Come this way, if you please. Lawrence was pleased when Martin fell in with them as Granby led the way upstairs. The midwingman's light conversation, which did not falter for an instant, made the atmosphere a great deal less uncomfortable. If you are the naval fellow who snatched an imperial out of the jaws of France, Lord, it is a famous story. The frogs must be gnashing their teeth and tearing their hair out over it, Martin said exultantly. I hear you took the egg off a hundred-gun ship. Was the battle very long? I am afraid rumor has magnified my accomplishments, Lauren said. The Amity was not a first rate at all, but a thirty-six, a frigate, and her men were nearly fallen down for thirst. Her captain offered a very valiant defense, but it was not a very great contest. Ill fortune and the weather did our work for us. I can claim only to have been lucky. Oh, well, luck is nothing to sneeze at either. We would not get very far if luck were against us, Martin said. Hello, have they put you at the corner? You will have the wing howling at all hours. Lawrence came into the circular tower room and looked around his new accommodation with pleasure. To a man used to the confines of a ship's cabin, it seemed spacious, and the large curved windows a great luxury. He looked out over the lake, where a thin gray drizzle had started. When he opened them, a cold, wet smile came boiling in, not unlike the sea, except for lack of salt. His bandboxes were piled a little haphazardly together beside the wardrobe. He looked inside this with some concern, but this things it but his things had been put away neatly enough. 
A writing desk and chair completed the furnishings beside the plain but ample bed. It seemed perfectly quiet to me. I am sure it will do nicely, he said, unbuckling his sword and laying it upon the bed. He did not feel comfortable taking off his coat, but he could at least reduce the formality of his appearance a little by his, this measure. Shall I show you to the feeding grounds now? Granby said stiffly. It was his first contribution to the conversation since they had left the club. Oh, we ought to show him the baths first, and the dining hall, Martin said. The baths are something to see, he added to Lauren. Lawrence, they were built by the Romans, you know, and they are why we are all here at all. Thank you. I would be glad to see them, Lawrence said, although he would have been happy to let the obviously unwilling lieutenant escape. He could not say otherwise now without being rude. Granby might be discourteous, but Lawrence did not intend to stoop to the same behavior. They passed the dining hall on the way. Martin, chattering away, told him that the captains and lieutenants dined at the smaller round table, then mid-wingmen and signs at the long rectangle. Thankfully, the cadets come much come in and eat earlier, for the rest of us would starve, but we had to hear them squalling throughout our meals, and then the ground crew eat after us, he finished. Do you never take your meals separately? Lawrence asked. The communal dining was rather odd for officers, and he thought wistfully that he would miss being able to invite friends to his own table. It had been one of his greatest pleasures ever since he had won enough money, or enough in prize money to afford it. Of course, if someone is sick, a tray will be sent up, Martin said. Oh, are you hungry? I suppose you had no dinner. Hi, Tolly, he called, and a servant crossing the room with a sack of linens turned to look at them, an eyebrow raised. This is Captain Lawrence. He has just flown in. Can you manage something for him? Or must... <sighs> he wait until supper. No, thank you. I am not hungry. I am... I was speaking only from curiosity, Lawrence said. Oh, there's no trouble about it, the man Tolly said, answering directly. I dare say one of the cooks can cut you a fair slice or two and dish up some potatoes. I will ask Nan. Tower room on the third floor. Yes? He nodded and went on his way without even waiting for a reply. There, Tolly will take care of you, Martin said, evidently, without the least consciousness of anything out of the ordinary. He is one of the best fellows. Jen Jenkins is never willing to oblige, and Marvel will get it done, but he will moan about it so that you wish you hadn't asked. I imagine that you have difficulty finding servants who are not bothered by the dragons, Lawrence said. He is beginning to adjust the informality of the aviators' dress among themselves, but to find a similar degree in the servant had bemused him afresh. Oh, they are all born and bred in the villages hereabouts, so they are used to it and us, Martin said, as they walked through the hall long hall. I suppose Tolly has been working here since he was a squeaker. He would not bat an eye at a regal co cooper in a tantrum. A metal door closed off the stairway leading down to the bath, where Granby pulled it open. A gust of hot, wet air came out and steamed in the relative cold of the corridor. Lawrence followed the other two down the narrow, spiraling stair. It went down for four turns and, openly abrupt and opened abruptly into a large bare room with shelves of stone but all the walls and faded paintings upon the walls. Partly chipped away, obvious relics of Roman times. One side held heaps of folded and stacked linens, the other a few piles of discarded cloths. Just leave your things on the shelves, Martin said. The baths are in a circuit, so we come back out here again. He and Grammy were already stripping. Have we time to bathe now? Lawrence asked a little dubiously. Martin paused and taking off his boots. Oh, I thought we would just stroll through. No, Granby? Is it not as though there is a need to rush? Supper will not be for a few hours yet. Unless you have something urgent to attend to, Granby said to Lawrence, so ungraciously that Martin looked between them in surprise, as if now only now noticing the tension. Lawrence compressed his lips and held back a sharp word. He could not be checking every aviator who might be hostile to a navy. Navy, Navy man, and to some extent he understood resentment. He would have to win through it, just like a new wingman fresh on board. Not in the least, was all he said, though he was not sure why he had to strip down merely to tour the baths. He followed their example, save that he arranged his clothes with more care into two neat stacks, and he laid his coat atop them rather than creasing it by folding. Then they left the room by a corridor to the left and passed through another metal door at its end. 
He saw the scents and undressing as soon as they were through. The room beyond was so full of steam he could barely see past arm's length, and he was dripping wet instantly. If he had been dressed, his coat and boots would have been ruined and everything else soaked through. On naked skin, the steam was luxurious, just shy of being too hot, and his muscles unwound gratefully from the long flight. The room was tiled with benches built out of the walls at regular intervals. Few other fellows were lying about in the steam. Granby and Martin nodded to a couple of them as they led the way through and into the cavernous room beyond. This one was even warmer, but dry, and a long, shallow hole ran very neatly, nearly as full length. We are right under the courtyard now, and there is why the core has this place, Martin said, pointing. Deep niches were built into the long wall at regular intervals, and a fence of wrought iron barred them from the rest of the room while leaving them visible. Perhaps half the niches were empty, the other half were padded with fabric, and each had a single massive egg. They must be kept warm, you see, since we cannot spare the dragons to brood over them or let them bury them near volcanoes or such like as they would in nature. And there is no space to make a separate chamber for them? Lauren said, surprised. Of course there is space, Cranby said rudely. Martin glanced at him and left him hastily, for Lawrence could react. You see, everyone is in and out of here often, so if one of them begins to look a bit hard, we are more likely to notice it, he said hurriedly. Still trying to rein in his temper, Lawrence let Granby's remark pass and nodded to Martin. He had read in Sir Edward's book how unpredictable dragon and catching was, until the very end. Even knowing the species could only narrow the process down to a span of months, or for the larger breed's years. We think the angle went over there may hatch soon. That would be famous, Martin went on, pointing at a golden brown egg, its sides faintly pearlescent and spotted with flecks of brighter yellow. This is a versteris of versarias, yet she is the flag dragon of the channel. I was signal and sign aboard her, fresh out of training, and no beast in her class can touch her for maneuvering. Both of the gators looked at the egg with wistful expressions longingly. Of course, each of those was represented a rare chance of promotion, and one even more uncertain than the favor of admiralty, which might be courted or won by Fowler in the field. Have you served with many dragons? Lawrence asked Martin. Only observe ya, and then in in La Cremas. He was injured in a skirmish over the channel a month ago, and so here I am on the ground, Martin said. But he will be fit for duty again in a month, and I got a promotion out of it, so I shouldn't complain. I am just made mid-wingman, he added proudly. And Granby here has been with more, for is that not right, who before I laid a ficket? Xerxes, Buter, and Actionus. Granby answered very briefly. But the first name had been enough. Lawrence finally understood, and his face hardened. The fellow likely had, was friend to Lieutenant Days. At any rate, the two of them had been the equivalent of shipmates until recently, and it was now clear to him that Granby's offensive behavior was not simply the general resentment of an aviator for a naval officer shoehorned into his service, but also a personal matter, and thus in some sense an extension of Days' original insult. Lawrence was far less inclined to tolerate any slight for such a cause, and he said abruptly, Let us continue, gentlemen. He allowed no further delays during the remainder of the tour, and let Martin carry the conversation as he would without giving any response that might draw it out. He came back to the dressing room after completing the circuit of the bath, and once dressed again, Lawrence said quietly but firmly, Mr. Granby, you will take me to the feeding grounds now, then I may set you at liberty. He made it clear to the man that the disrespect would not be tolerated. If Granby were to make another fling, he would have to be checked, and better by far were to occur in private. Mr. Martin, I am obliged to you for your company and your explanations. They have been most valuable. You are very welcome, Martin said, looking between Lawrence and Granby, uncertainly, as if afraid of what might happen if he left them alone. But Lawrence had made his hint quite unmistakable, and despite the informality, Martin seemed able to see that it had merely the weight of an order. And I will see you both at supper, I imagine, until then. 
In silence, Lawrence continued with Granby to the feeding grounds, or rather to a ledge that overlooked them at the far end of the trading valley. The mouth of a natural cul-de-sac was visible at the far end of the valley, and Lawrence could see several herdsmen there on duty. Granby explained in a flat voice that when signaled from the ledge, these would pick out the appropriate number of beasts per dragon and send them into the valley, where the dragon might hunt them down and eat, so long as no training flight was in progress. It's straightforward enough, I trust, Granby said. In conclusion, his tone was highly disagreeable, and yet another step toward over the line, as Lawrence had feared. Sir, Lawrence said quietly. Granby looked in momentary confusion, and Lawrence repeated, It is straightforward enough, sir. He hoped it would be enough to warm Granby off from another disrespect, but almost unbelievably, the lieutenant answered back, saying, we do not stand on ceremony here, whatever you may have been used to in the Navy. I have been used to court courtesy where I do not receive where I do not receive it. I will insist at the least on the respect due to rank, Lawrence said, his temper breaking loose. He glared savagely at Granby and felt the color coming into his face. You will amend your address immediately, Lieutenant Granby, or by God I shall have you broken for insubordination. I do not imagine that the Corps takes quite so light a view of it as one might gather from your behavior. Granby went very pale. The sunburn across his cheeks stood out red. Yes, sir, he said, and stood sharply at attention. Dismiss, Lieutenant, Lawrence said at once, and turned away to gaze out over the field with arms clasped behind his back until Granby had left. He did not want to even look at the fellow again. With the sustaining flesh of righteous anger gone, he was tired and miserable to have met with such treatment. In addition, he now had to anticipate with dismay the consequences he knew would follow on his having checked the man. Granby had seemed on their first intent, instant of meeting, to be friendly and likable by nature. Even if he were not, he was still one of the aviators and Lawrence an interloper. Granby's fellow would naturally support him, and their hostility could only make Lawrence's circumstances unpleasant. But there had been no alternative. Open disrespect could not be borne, and Granby had known very well that his behavior was beyond the pal. Lawrence was still downcast when he turned back inside. His spirits rose only as he walked into the courtyard and felt Temeraire awake and waiting for him. I am sorry to have abandoned you for so long, Lawrence said, leaning against his side and petting him, more of his own comfort than Temeraire's. Have you been very bored? No, not at all, Temeraire said. There were a great many people who came by and spoke to me. Some of them measured me for a new harness. Also, I've been talking to Maximus here, and he tells me we are to trade together. Lawrence nodded a greeting to the regal keeper, who had acknowledged the mention of his name by opening a sleepy eye. Maximus lifted his massive head enough to return the gesture, and then sank back down. Are you hungry? Lawrence asked, turning back to Timur. We must be up early to fly for Celeritas. Sol that is the training master here, he added. You will likely not have time in the morning. Yes, I would like to eat, Timur said. He seemed wholly unsurprised to have a dragon as training master. And in the face of his pragmatic response, Lawrence felt a little silly for his own first shock. Of course, Temeraire would see nothing strange in it. Lawrence did not bother strapping himself back on completely for the short hop to the ledge, and there he dismounted to let Temeraire hunt without a passenger. The uncomplicated pleasure of watching the dragon soar and dive so gracefully did a great deal to, see, to ease Lawrence's mind. No matter how the aviator should respond to him, his position was secure in a way that no sea captain could hope for. He had experience in managing unwilling men, if it came to that in his crew, and at least Martin's example showed that not all the officers would be prejudiced against him from the beginning. There was some other comfort also. As Temeraire swooped and snatched a lumbering, shaggy-haired cow nearly off the ground and settled down to eat it, Lawrence heard enthusiastic murmuring and looked up to see a row of small heads poking out of the windows above. That is the Imperial, sir, is he not? One of the boys, dandy-haired and round-faced, called out to him. Yes, that is Temeraire, Lawrence answered. He had always made an effort towards the education of his young gentleman, and the ship had been considered a prime place for a squeaker. He had many family and service friends to do favors for, so he had fairly extensive experience of boys, most of it favorable. 
Unlike many grown men, he was not at all uncomfortable in their company, even if these were younger than most of his midshipmen ever had been. Look, look, how smashing another one! Smaller and darker cried and pointed. Temeraire was skimming low to the ground and collecting up all three sheep he had, that had been released for him before stopping to eat again. I dare say you all have more experience in dragonflight than I. Does he show to advantage? he asked them. Oh, yes was the general enthusiastic response. Corners on a wink with a nod, the sandy-haired boy said, adopting a professional tone. And splendid extension, not a wasted wing beam. Oh, ripping, he added, dissolving back into a small boy as Timur back wing to take the last cow. Sir, you haven't picked your runners yet, have you? Another dark-haired one asked, hopefully, which at once set up a clamor among all the others, all of them announcing their worthiness for what Lawrence gathered was some position to which Particularly favored cadets were assigned in a dragon crew. No, and I imagine when I do, it will be on the advice of your instructors, he said with mock severity. So I dare say you ought to mind them properly the next few weeks. There, have you had enough? He asked as Temerary rejoined him on the ledge, landing directly on the edge with perfect balance. Oh yes, they were very tasty, but now I am all over blood. May we go and wash up, Temerary said. Lawrence realized belatedly this had been omitted from his tour. He glanced up at the children. Gentlemen, I must ask you for directions. Shall I take him to the lake for bathing? They all stared down at him with round, round surprised eyes. I have never heard of bathing a dragon, one of them said. The sandy-haired one added, I mean, can you imagine trying to wash a regal? It would take ages. Usually they lick their chops and talons clean like a cat. That does not sound very pleasant. I like being washed, even if it is a great deal of work, Temerer said, looking at Lawrence anxiously. Lawrence suppressed an exclamation and said equably, Certainly it is a great deal of work, but so are many other things that ought to be done. We shall go to the lake at once. Only wait here a moment, Temerer. I will go and fetch some linens. Oh, oh and I will bring you some. The sandy-haired boy vanished from the windows. The rest immediately followed. And scarcely five minutes later, the whole half a dozen of them had come spilling out onto the ledge with a pile of imperfectly folded linens, whose providence Lawrence suspected. He took them all anyway, thanking the boys gravely, and climbed back aboard, making a mental note of the sandy-haired fellow. It was a sort of initiative he liked to see and considered the making of an officer. He could bring our carabiner belts tomorrow, and then we could ride along and help, the boy added now, with the two Guiltless expression. Lawrence eyed him and wondered if this was forwardness to discourage, but he was secretly cheered by the enthusiasm, so he contented himself with saying firmly, We shall see. They stood watching from the ledge, and Lawrence saw their eager faces until Temeraire came around the castle and they passed out of sight. Once at the lake, he let Temeraire swim about to clean off the worst of the gore, then wiped him down with particular care. It was appalling to a man raised to daily holy stoning of the deck that aviators should leave their beasts to keep themselves clean, and as he rubbed down the sleek black sides, he suddenly considered the harness. Tim Rare, does this shave you at all? he asked, touching the straps. Oh, not very often now, Tim Rare said, turning his head to look. My hide is getting a great deal tougher, and when it does bother me, I can shift it a little, and then it is better straight away. My dear, I am covered with shame, Warren said. I uh, never have kept you in it. From now on, you shall not wear it for an instant while it is not necessary for our flying together. But is it not required, like your clothing? Timur said. I would not like anyone to think I was not civilized. I shall get you a larger chain to wear around your neck, and that will serve, Lauren said, thinking of the golden collar Celeritas <sighs> wore. I am not going to have you suffering for a custom that, so far as I can tell, is nothing but laziness, and I am of a mind to complain of it in the strongest terms to the next admiral I see. He was as good as his word and stripped the harness from Temeraire the moment he land they landed in the courtyard. Temeraire looked a little nervously at the other dragons who had been watching with interest from the moment the two of them had returned with Temeraire still dripping from the lake. But none of them seemed shocked, only curious, and once Lawrence had detached the golden and pearl chain and wrapped it around one of Temur's talons, rather like a ring, 
and Rare relaxed entirely and settled back down on the warm flagstones. It is more pleasant not to have it on. I had not realized how it would be, he confided quietly to Lawrence, and scratched at a darkened spot on his hide where a buckle had rested and crushed together several scales into a callus. Lawrence put, paused in cleaning the harness and stroked in an apology. I do beg your forgiveness, he said, looking at the galled spot with remorse. I will try and find a poultice for these marks. I want mine off, too, chirped one of the Winchesters suddenly and flitted down from Maximus's back to land in front of Lawrence. Will you please? Lawrence hesitated. It did not seem right to him to handle another man's beast. I think perhaps your handler is the only one who ought to remove it, he said. I do not like to give offense. He has not come for three days, the Winchester sadly, said sadly, his small head drooping. He was only about the size of a couple of draft horses, and his shoulder barely topped Lawrence's head. Looking more closely, Lawrence could see his hide was marked with streaks of dried blood, and the harness did not look particularly clean or well kept, unlike those of the other dragons. It bore stains and rough patches. Come here and let me have a look at you, Lawrence said quietly as he took up the linens, still wet from the lake, and began to clean the little dragon. Oh, thank you, the Winchester said, leaning happily into the cloth. My name is Levitus, he added shyly. I am Lawrence, and this is Temer, Lawrence said. Lawrence is my captain, Temer said, the smallest hint of belligerence in his tone, and an emphasis on the possessive. Lawrence looked up to him in surprise and paused in his cleaning to pat Temer aside. Temer subsided, but washed it with his pupils narrowed to thin slits while Lawrence finished. Shall I see if I cannot find what has happened to your handler, he told Levitus with a final pat. Perhaps he is not feeling well, but if so, I am sure he will be well soon. Oh, I do not think he is sick, Levitus said with that same sadness. But that feels much better already, he added, and rubbed his head gratefully against Lawrence's shoulder. Temeraire gave a low, displeased grumble and flexed his talons against the stone with an alarmed chirp. Levitus flew straight away to Maximus's back and nestled down small against the other Winchester again. Lawrence turned to Temer. Come now, what is this jealousy? He said softly. Surely you cannot begrudge him a little cleaning when his handler is neglecting him. You are mine, Temer said obstinately. After a moment, however, he ducked his head in a shamefaced way and added in a smaller voice. He would be easier to clean. I would not give up an inch of your hide where you twice lift late of the size, Lawrence said, but perhaps I will see if some of the boys would like to wash him tomorrow. Oh, that would be good, Temera said, brightening. I do not quite understand why his handler has not come. You would never stay away so long, would you? Never in my life unless I was kept away by force, Lawrence said. He did not understand it himself. He could only imagine that a man harnessed to a dim beast would not necessarily find the creature's company satisfying intellectually. But at the least, he would have expected the easy affection with which he had seen James treat Gladius. And though even smaller, Levitus was certainly more intelligent than Volley. Perhaps it was not so strange that there would be less dedicated men among aviators as well as in any other branch of the surface. But with the shortage of dragons, it seemed a great pity to see one of them reduced to unhappiness, which could not help but affect the creature's performance. Lawrence carried Temeraris harness with him out of the castle yard and over to the large sheds where the ground crews worked. Though it was late in the day, there were several men still sitting out in front, smoking comfortably. They looked at him curiously, not saluting, but not unfriendly either. Ah, you'd be Temeraris. One of them said, reaching out to take the harness. Has it broken? We'll be having a proper harness ready for you in a few days, but we can patch it up in the meantime. No, it nearly means needs cleaning, Lawrence said. You haven't a harness tender yet? We can't be assigning you your ground crew so we know how he's to be trained, the man said. But we'll see to it. Holland, give this a rub, would you? He called, catching the attention of a younger man who was working on a bit of leather work inside. Holland came out, wiping grease off onto his apron and took the harness in big, capable-looking hands. Right you are. He will give me... Will he give me any trouble putting it back on him after? He asked. 
That will not be necessary, thank you. He is more comfortable without it. So merely leave it beside him, Lauren said firmly, ignoring the looks his, this won him. And Levitus's harness requires attention as well. Levitus? Well, now, I'd say that's for his captain to speak to his crew about, the first man said, sucking on his pipe thoughtfully. That was perfectly true. Nevertheless, it was a poor-spirited answer. Lawrence gave the man a cold, steady look and let silence speak for him. The men shifted a little uncomfortably under his glare. He said very softly, If they need to be rebuked to do their duty, then it must be arranged. I would not have thought any man in the Corps would need to hear anything but that a dragon's well-being was at risk to seek to amend the situation. I'll do it along for dropping off Temeraire's, Helen said hurriedly. I don't mind. He's so small, it won't take me but a few, sh a few shakes. Thank you, Mr. Helen. I'm glad to see I was not mistaken, Lauren said and turned back to the castle. He heard the murmur behind him of, Regular Tartar he is, wouldn't fancy being on his crew. It was not a pleasant thing to hear at all. He had never been considered a hard captain, and he had always prided himself on ruling his men by respect rather than fear or of a heavy hand. Many of his crew had been volunteers. He was conscious, too, of guilt. By speaking so strongly, he had indeed gone over the head of Levitus' captain, and the man would have every right to complain. But Lawrence could not quite bring himself to forget it. Levitus was clearly neglected, and it in no way fit his sense of duty to leave the creature in discomfort. The informality of the corps might, for once, be of service to him. With any luck, the hint might not be taken as direct interference, or as truly outrageous as it would have been in the Navy. It had not been an auspicious first day. He was both weary and discouraged. There had been nothing truly unacceptable as he feared, nothing so bad he could not bear it, but also nothing easy or familiar. He could not help but long for the comforting strictures of the Navy, which had encompassed all of his life, and wish impractically that he and Temeraire might be once again on the deck of the Reliant, with all the wide ocean around them.